Hello there, and welcome along to the first hour of our speaking sessions today on ClueCon Deconstructed. Abby, where did that last 20 minutes just evaporate to between the end of Dangerous Demos and right now? Time flies when you're having fun, David, and this has been so much fun. <laughs> Sure I do does. have a couple of announcements for you guys before we get started on our speakers. Uh, I just wanted to let you guys know that we're going to be doing a raffle at one o'clock. So keep your ears perked for that. And if you're interested in being eligible to win, all you have to do is hang out with us at ClueCon Deconstructed in one of our conference rooms. Uh, even when we're doing these live streams, we've got uh, broadcast cafes open so you guys can discuss what's going on. And we have the gigabit reception tonight from 4 30 central to 6 30 central and you are all invited it's going to be so much fun we're going to be having an open jam room so bring your guitars and your instruments we'll have a karaoke room a game room where we can play some games we're going to be streaming movies and of course we'll have tons of rooms open as uh, makeshift bars so we can just hang and chit chat about how the week's been going uh what's up with us and uh about technology. So it's going to be a lot of fun. Uh, and I just wanted to invite all of you to sign up for ClueCon next year. Fingers crossed we'll all be in person again, uh, but uh, you can get more information about that at cluecon.com if you're interested in learning more. You can also follow us on our social media channels, our Facebook and our Twitter accounts. We have a ClueCon and a free switch account that will both let you know about what's happening and keep you updated. And if you haven't already, make sure to sign up for our Slack channel at signalwire.community. We put information there about this year's ClueCon, next year's ClueCon, about SignalWire, about FreeSwitch. So if you have any questions about anything at all, that's where someone can answer them for you. And uh, that's all the announcements I have for today. I'm so excited for today's speakers, and I'll catch you at one to give away some prizes. Me too, Abby. I'm excited too. Now, we've been talking about karaoke a lot. Quick bit of trivia oh. before we move to our first speaker. Do you know what the Japanese word karaoke means? I don't. To sing off key, perhaps? <laughs> <laughs> to, to make a fool of oneself in front of an audience? No, it actually means empty orchestra. That is the word, oh. the meaning of the word karaoke. I just thought you'd like to know. I would like to know. You, we learn new things every day here at ClueCon. Uh, certainly do. Okay, thank you very much, Abby. We'll say goodbye to you and see you soon. And we'll bring Lorenzo Mangani, our first speaker, into the room. Hey, Lorenzo, how are you doing today? Hello, David. I'm doing great. How are you doing? It's excellent to see you. I'm doing real well. And uh, it's always a pleasure to connect with you at the various events that we've been to together over the years. Lorenzo. And uh, I need to point yeah. out, because I always do this, that you are one of those three Lorenzos in the world of VoIP and RTC. Um, we've had Lorenzo Miniero in the Dangerous Demos earlier today. And Lorenzo Emili and Military from Lowway is, of course, a sponsor of ClueCon Deconstructed. So I, I feel we've collected the set. So that's absolutely a, a very positive thing. Now, Lorenzo, uh, everybody is so grateful for your contributions. You and uh, Alex and the rest of the team for the Homer project. And I gather that you've got a bit of a presentation to tell us about what's going on in the project. Quite indeed, and thank you on behalf, of course, of me, Alexander, and the whole team. Uh, indeed, it's a you know catch-up uh, presentation because a lot has been happening, a lot of things have been you know been implemented into the project. So, just one of the uh, many presentations that it will take uh, to you know get all of the innovations across. So thank you for having us and giving us a chance. Yeah, you're very, you're very, very welcome. And I, I know that uh, everybody is gagging to see your presentation. So let's get your slides up and set you off. Absolutely. All right. So, um, well, uh, I would start, you know, by defining uh, the, the problem, uh, which is doesn't matter how smart you are and how perfect your product is, troubleshooting is going to be part of the process. So uh, it's something that I think we're all familiar with. Uh, it's all nice and easy in the lab. It works uh, on your setup. And then once it scales, once it gets into the customer's hands, uh, once you uh, migrate it to another network, uh, issues begin. And then we have brand new problems and very old tools uh, to address them with. So, you know, getting remote access, filtering, doing console work, those are all things that, you know, are 
a pain and make the job uh, a sad one. And this is where Homer comes in, or at least this is how it happened. Uh, Homer, for those who are not familiar with it, it's a smart, uh, I would like to define it, uh, which is optimized for our business. So real-time communications from uh, you know the uh, old stuff uh, through everything that's VoIP into uh, WebRTC and everything that's up and coming. And it's designed as a set of module tools that we can assemble to build a monitoring alerting solution or uh, whatnot. It's built on top of the HEP encapsulation protocol, which is was uh, it's Alexander's creation and the reason why Homer exists, uh, which is luckily uh, integrated in many platforms. So this is the real fuel of the solution. And on the other end, we have standard integration with other platforms for emitting data. Uh, and we'll get into this during the presentation. So whether it's a classic setup, a uh, void stack or WebRTC, Homer is ready, or at least he has pieces of uh, the solution designed to help with the process of troubleshooting. Behind Homer is QXIP, which is uh, our uh, research and development company. Um, and the fun fact is that it all started uh, on a ClueCon call 12 years ago, uh, which is where I've met Alexander uh, online. We actually met in person just many years afterwards, but you know, th this is the house of our idea and the reason why we met each other. So, you know, it's, uh, uh, a very important element in our history and also in our future. So the, also the first app implementation was uh, in FreeSwitch and it was done also by Alexander with Anthony's help. So, uh, you know, uh, a lot of uh, memories and a lot of power related to this. And then, of course, from uh, ever since we have uh, helped thousands of uh, individuals and companies deploy the solutions or pieces of it. And it gave us a chance to see what the, you know, real world problems are where you're talking about state of the art telephony and IP telephony. So Homer is basically our perpetual contribution to uh, to our ecosystem and hopefully a place where we can, you know, express our expertise and make it available to others. So uh, just to, you know, set the stack up, it all starts with packets or events or something that needs to be captured. And for this, we have our HEP agents. Many are integrated into the flagship platforms that make all of our architectures up. And those will selectively uh, get some of the data and send it using the HEP encapsulation protocol. Once it lands to the other side, it gets indexed, uh, tags are extracted, and a correlation process begins to make this data uh, available and easy to find for the troubleshooting process. The idea is that we make people's life easier with the solution when it's well uh, set up. Um, there's a bunch of features. And the, the primary one are the integration. So the fact that you can use app in all of the, the platforms that we support, so from Freeze, which asterisk, everything through the proxies, Kamaido, open SIPs, uh, the media relays, there's a little bit of app for everything. And we also have external integrations now. Uh, we have you know, uh, spent some more time making it more usable. So uh, we have a bigger team uh, that works on the UI and the functionality. So uh, it, it grew, let's say, on the front end the most uh, during this last phase. So we added a lot of things that make it easier to use, dynamic forms. Uh, we improved the way we display flows, and we can display now everything, data, SIP, protocols, bunch of stuff. Uh, we have added um, inputs for web sockets so that now you know web elements can send uh, data statistics to, uh, to the stack, uh, new APIs, portable agents, extended time series. So there's a bunch of things that are going on. Um, for those that are curious, you know, just to start from the uh, the outer layer, this is how Homer works when you uh, install the latest version. So it's still forms and results, but you know they're a little more fun. It's still super easy to find something uh, within uh, the the stack. We can travel back and forth in time. We can have Homer assemble our sessions, and now it's uh, also able to display logs, RTV statistics, flows, and a bunch of things in line. Uh, at the same time, we can look at uh, statistics of our calls over a timeline, be it RTCP, which is in almost every system, or RTP with additional analyzers. And we can also build dashboards that communicate with our systems. So we can go and uh, talk with other Grafana deployments, or we can display stats that are within uh, the realm of Homer. Uh, the point is to make it easy, fun to use, usable, fast uh, for everybody, uh, be it, you know, an expert that's going to, you know, go look for something deep or just a tier one agent that it just needs to find, you know, the probable root cause to escalate. Um, Homer, it's modular now, so it's... Uh,
multi-widget uh, type of environments where everybody can make their own dashboard and decide what tools you know make their day. Um, we're going to start today uh, by looking at search, which is you know the, the busiest and most popular feature. So search forms are everything. And in Homer now we can support not just SIP, but any protocol that we can define through mapping. And I'll show you what mapping is later on. So the forms are built on top of definitions uh, that tell us how a protocol is composed, which fields it has, how we should search them, and so on. And it's a drag and drop from there on. So once we define this schema, you can basically build a form just by dragging and drop. Um, if this is too old school, we also have one line uh, smart search forms, which are inspired by Loki and uh, Splunk. Uh, and basically allow you to do a one line query with autocomplete. So you can go through the fields that make uh, specific protocols. So for SIP, you're going to find all of the headers and so on. For your custom protocols, you're going to find whatever you, you have there. And you can just make very quickly in line queries. And it's all about being fast. So um, in the new version of Homer, the search and the results can coexist in the same uh, page. So you don't have to jump back and forth. You can continuously refine your queries or add new parameters without leaving uh, the, the results that you're looking at. And this is a huge booster for speed. And it's all about that, right? How quickly we can get somebody closer to resolving a problem. Um, by default, this is what you'll find. So when you install Homer the first time, you throw some traffic and it becomes immediately searchable. Um, the search results themselves can be uh, arranged in whichever way a user wants. Each user has their own preferences. So if you want to see the IP part, you do. If you don't, uh, you don't. So you can kind of refine it to match uh, you know, an engineer's preference. And it can be different between users. So there's a lot of freedom there. And once we select some results, basically the magic happens. So Homer starts spinning, and he gets all of the information together for you. Here we can see like a back-to-back uh, session that gets automatically correlated. So we can clearly see which legs would belong to each session by color coding. The SIP messages or include logs. We can select all of the legs or just some. We can go through the media statistics, which again are a timeline that tells us how the media uh, of uh, a, a certain color multiple legs is doing. We can look at logs. There's a lot of it in there. And for this reason, we have this uh, now contextual menu which sits at the top right of every session that we open. And in here, we can choose if we only want to look at SIP, if we also want to see RTCP, logs, or anything else that's being sent to the platform. Keep in mind with Homer, you can also design and implement uh, your own uh, uh, protocol uh, using you know, quotas. So it can be just anything. And this will immediately display in here. So if you uh, implement a new hep type and you send it to the platform, it shows up. Um, behind everything we were saying is mapping. So what is mapping? Mapping is a way uh, that we have in the new Homer generation to define something within the system. So for SIP, which is a good example to start from, if you're looking into this, you will find all of the headers uh, that we allow, let's say, the platform to make searchable, to index, and to uh, use for uh, either search or correlation, which are like the two majors in the platform. So you can go, you can modify it, you can implement custom headers. So you can have extractions. There's a link between the sniffing part and the search part. But you get the gist. You can uh, implement just about anything you want that's custom on top of what's standard. Uh, this is the same for, uh, we said SIP, but it could be CDRs. It could be a, another custom signaling protocol that you design. It doesn't matter. It makes sure that the database part and the UI part remain flexible so things can change over time and we don't need to uh, drop tables or do anything fancy. The second thing that it allows us to do is to create a correlation logic. So in a typical scenario that I try to sketch here, uh, we never have a single session. So we always have a multi one or multiple forks. Those can be back-to-back -back user agent forks or just maybe multiple proxy legs. It can be a bunch of, th of uh, things on the way to a completed call. And all of these things will have their own logs, their own statistics, and so on. So how do we put them together is using mapping. So within the mapping config, we can define the rules that basically allow Omer to automatically look for other legs. So we can say every time you have a call ID ABC, also try to look for ABC uh, plus a suffix. And if it finds a session, it will automatically fetch also its statistics, media statistics, and so on. And then it keeps going down the chain. So uh, it's made or it's designed to adjust to uh, complex scenarios 
out of hundreds of operators that we help each year, none of them has the same logic in place. So it's imperative that this stays programmable. Uh, within uh, the mapping, we can also define functions. So it's not just about you know one to one. We can generate data, we can hash fields, we can uh, do external lookups. So there's a lot in there to be used. Um, um, so here, this is just an example where we take like a standard field and then we try to add a suffix to it. It's a common uh, Kamailio implementation case, uh, but it could be again anything. So you can use uh, JavaScript to any extent. You can even load external libraries and do anything you want. Um, on top of this, we have mapping pipelines. The pipelines are like uh, you know the tail uh, of mapping, and they can be used to run functions. Uh, on the input and output stage of the process. So this is uh, useful if, uh, let's say, we have data in the database, but we don't want to display them in the UI. So using this technique, we can uh, hide IPs, replace phone numbers, remove private details from calls, whatever, let's say, the admin of the platforms uh, deems necessary to be compliant. And on the input chain, we can uh, run lookups or we can argument the data in many ways. So it creates let's say, uh, a scriptable pipeline on both ends of the process that can be used to adjust it. So here we have an example where, for instance, we want to conceal uh, some data. We want to change the IP uh, of a packet that's displayed. So keep in mind the database, it remains correct. But what is displayed to the UI might be different. This is the case where you don't want to show uh, part of your infrastructure or you just want to hide some details. We can also inter insert artificial headers this way. So you know it can have a lot of uses. Uh, to bridge between uh, the back end and the front end to create uh, with our sets something different. Um, but what about modifying the data before it goes to the database? So uh, there could also be cases where we simply don't want any private details to go into the platform or we, where we just want to eliminate them upfront. And for this, we have an extension in Amplify Server, which is the component that receives the packets in the stack uh, that implements Luajit uh, scripts and Go expressions. Uh, in the input chain. So as the packet comes, uh, it can be modified in a number of ways. Uh, so again, we can eliminate IPs, we can modify fields, we can anonymize the data and uh, be sure that the database doesn't contain anything that's infringing you know, our, or uh, creating liabilities, which is important for some. And this is done at native speed. So it doesn't add a lot of overhead to the pipeline and can be uh, very easily deployed. I'm not a Lua master. Alexander would be better at this. But here we have a simple example where we say, OK, if an IP matches 127.0.0.1, replace it with something else, or implement a custom header to be injected based on uh, any logic, or extract something from the actual SIP signaling and write it as a custom field. So in this case, we take the value of CSEC and we write it as a header. This header can be used for tagging the traffic. So this is also useful <coughs> if we want to use uh, this pipeline to add tags that would influence time series. So deciding that this packet should be called customer X and see this tag down the line. Uh, and talking about this, where are the statistics? Um, Homer, the, the last generation, did not reinvent the wheel. So for those that don't know, we decided not to re-implement our own schema, but rather make it compatible with just about anything that customers want to use. Uh, it turned out that most people nowadays either want to use InfluxDB or Prometheus uh, to store time series. So those are the two primary ones, but we also have others such as Timescale uh, and a few more. And uh, the integration is the same. So the UI can in, uh, talk to those platforms to read data, and the backend can write to them. Uh, a lot of the magic happens, of course, uh, on the shoulders of giants. So um, in, especially for the InfluxDB part, we have Telegraph, which allows the data to be sent to just uh, as many platforms as, as they support uh, within uh, uh, their stack, which is like dozens. And this makes Homer compatible with uh, existing uh, systems. So the customers can now choose where they want this time series to want, where they want their NOC to uh, look at them, and create different dashboards even at the same time on different uh, backends. This includes all of the standards KPIs that you would expect, uh, but it also includes tag uh, statistics that I've shown you before. When traffic comes from a specific entity, apply a tag and use this tag to make reports. So we can filter by a specific customer, specific cluster element, or a system type, whatever you think it's necessary you know, to make your 
uh, to give visibility to your uh, traffic and then its problems. Uh, the uh, beauty of it is that you can leverage standard tools. So most people nowadays will do this job in Grafana and we support it natively. So we also have uh, a bunch of presets for KPIs that Happy uh, that Homer sorry can uh, produce. And those are available on grafana.com. So you can just go there and uh, import them straight into your setup and attach it to our uh, data sources and get basically the best of it out of the box. Uh, if you want to know more about time series, we did some dedicated presentations. It's kind of a you know time-consuming subject, and you know it deserves a lot of time. Um, or you can just you know contact us, and we would be happy to talk about it. Now, uh, jumping forward, WebRTC, uh, of course, it's like a super important piece of everybody's setups nowadays, uh, either as the core or at the edge. You know, developing uh, new ways to provide services. So where is it? Uh, it actually has been in Homer for quite a long time, uh, mostly thanks to our, you know, uh, uh, friend projects that allow us to, you know, study uh, the problems early on. Uh, Janus, I would say, and Lorenzo for the most, you know, helped us walk into this. Uh, but, you know, for uh, there's, there's various scenarios and the support has been there for quite a long time. It's just that not many people actually have used it. So hopefully, you know, this uh, rings some bells. So for the simple cases where it's SIP over WebRTC, there's nothing to be done because it's already supported by our uh, standard coverage. So uh, if you use freeze, which can either open SIPs to a vehicle that it's already all in there thanks to the existing app integration. So that's easy. If you instead use something that's custom, uh, you can leverage our new WebSocket support in Homer so that you can literally have your clients uh, send data directly to a collector uh, to be uh, part of your troubleshooting, and you can design this data yourself. So from uh, what is being sent to how it's being displayed, now it's all about just uh, customization, configuration of the elements. Uh, or if you use one of the supported platforms, in this case, Janus and Mediasoup uh, would be the leading ones, we have a full uh, stack of uh, working statistics with correlation and with a bunch of things such as logging events into Loki and sending and turning, let's say, time series that talk about media into uh, directly into InfluxDB or uh, Prometheus uh, through HEPOP. Uh, for those, uh, basically, it's plug and play, and we have a bunch of demos available on the repositories. Uh, HEPOP will be the, the tool that we, you would use. And in our Homer 7 Docker repository, you have a bunch of ready to go examples that just show you how you can plug those straight into uh, Homer for uh, troubleshooting them in near real time. Uh, quite powerful. And of course, uh, from the client side, we have a. So if you run uh, that as your meeting platform, uh, we have, uh, um, uh, I can't remember the name, statistics. Well, there's, there's a plugin with a JavaScript file that you can add and it starts sending uh, to Homer statistics that we can in inject. So whichever is the mix of the solution that you have, you should have a piece in Homer that allows you to troubleshoot it. Uh, but what about external data? So we know that we have a C protocol and we know that we have uh, you know, our uh, statistics and maybe some CDRs, but what if you have some other data that's vital to your troubleshooting that's hosted somewhere else? Uh, to solve this problem without getting into duplication, so just saying, hey, copy your table and make a schema, we came up with HEPSUB. HEPSUB is quite powerful, so it allows you to write a client application to Homer that connects to its API and advertises uh, the ability to do lookups on its behalf, meaning that every time a user interacts with Homer and or opens a certain session, let's say by call ID, HEPSUB agents can be also queried and they can use the data that's in the Homer session to do an external lookup. So let's say that you have some logs in Elasticsearch, for instance, uh, you could have it interact with Homer. So Homer can query your HEPSUB agent, which uh, behind the scenes, so without leaking any authentication with Homer or its users, can return data from another API. And this could be literally anything. Uh, the HEPSUB uh, demo clients are in uh, Node.js, but it's just API work, so that could you could be implemented in just about any other language. And that can be used for a number of purposes, such as finding additional correlation elements or looking up additional data that can complement. It even interacts with competing products such as Void Monitor. So if you have the Void Monitor sniffer, you can actually use AppSub to look up uh, and fetch pickups and audio files 
and play them back straight into Homer. So he has a lot of potential and we hope to see users, you know, get into it. So looking at the big, big picture one last time, uh, we have uh, a lot of happy integrations, again, free switch, uh, open SIPs, Camaelio, Asterisk, a bunch of the uh, WebRTC uh, big boys, so in Janus, in MediaSoup, and a little bit in Jitsi. We have Haplify, which is a passive agent that can be used for everything else. We have Passage, which is a, a log parser that can convert events into HEP. Uh, there's a bunch of uh, inputs that can be used, and we think they cover you know, uh, quite a lot of the uh, ecosystem um, to the elements on the server side, so the ability to modify the data in transit, ingress or egress, and write to a bunch of uh, backends, make a very flexible solution. So Omer, let's say it's just an implementation of our technologies, but all of those technologies individually could be used to build a piece of your own um, uh, monitoring solutions. And many operators are actually walk in this way. So they ask us to work with them on some of the elements and they actually implement it in their customer portal to allow uh, their users to you know, self troubleshoot or you know, uh, uh, let's say do, do part of the work themselves. So if this sounds interesting and you're ready to install it, uh, we have a script so you can run this on a real server or VM uh, using uh, our bash installer, which basically does most of the work, asks a few questions, a few permissions, or you can use uh, our Docker containers, which are basically ready demos that you can spin up very quickly to see if Omer is you know, the right guy for you and do a little bit of estimation in terms of um, how much capacity you would need to solve your problem, basically. Um, in any case, uh, we have a fantastic community of super generous uh, open source superheroes uh, that are happy to help around the clock. So either by joining our mailing list or opening an issue on our repositories or joining our new Discord server that we have a link for here, uh, you can get in touch with us and with our team and with our community. Uh, or if you want to run a professional services uh, project, you can write uh, to sales at QXIP, which is the company that sponsors uh, Homer and all of its doing. Uh, our, you know, our goal is really to to make it easy for people to to do the same job that we've been doing for so many years and uh, share our experience. And just one last word, you know, for those that are you know listening, uh, support open source before you ask open source to support you. So there's a lot of people like us that do this, you know, mainly out of passion. It's not like you know a business that makes you a millionaire that quick. Uh, and it's all about helping each other. And we see, you know trends uh, of positive and negative so you know it, it's always nice to support the people that try to help you even when you know maybe they can't or it doesn't succeed or it doesn't work the first time it doesn't make those guys bad guys just because they tried so we we hope that people you know improve and start loving open source back and that's all we had for today thank you thank so you. much for having us a few links here and happy of course to be get That's to know great. people directly so we're always reachable and always open for business thank you very much and uh, good good advice at the end there about supporting open source and of course you know it, it can be a financial contribution which is great um, but people often think when you talk about open source that you're looking for code contributions and that's one dimension but there are so many others aren't there we're looking for love just like everybody <laughs> Well, Lorenzo, let me tell you, at ClueCon Deconstructed, you've come to... I'd like to actually introduce the other speaker while you're still here, but because we've got Matteo Valentini here. Um, there's a bit of an Italian takeover going on. Hi, Matteo. How are you doing? Oh, you're still muted, Matteo, at the moment. Nice okay. to meet you, Matteo. <laughs> Hi. There we oh. are. Now, yes, I, I, I don't know the answer to this question, Matteo, but have you and Lorenzo ever met before? Uh, I think no. I don't think we had the pleasure. So nice meeting no. you, Matteo. Nice to meet you. <laughs> but, but there's, there's a lot of a power in Italian VoIP, isn't there? We mentioned the three Lorenzos, but it seems to be a bit of a VoIP and RTC powerhouse. Well, Italians talk a lot, so it kind of makes sense that we're into communications the most. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe yeah. that's a part of it. Okay, Lorenzo Mangani from the Homer Project and from QXIP. Thank you so much for joining us. And of course, for Thanks. everything you give to the community. We really appreciate it. Bye for now. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Bye bye. Matteo, it's great to have you along from Nephesis. Yes. And um, where, whereabouts are you joining us from today? Today, I'm joining from my office in uh, Pesaro, Italy.
Italy. Great to, great to have you along. And uh, Nethesis is a commercial company, but you have an open source Linux distribution. Is that right? Yes. Yes, we made a Linux uh, distribution that uh, in a server where uh, on top of that we base uh, our product. So Great. Good. good news. Now, I, I just want to, I know, I know Lorenzo Mangani will still be listening here, and I just want to remind him to nip over to the broadcast cafe in order to take questions from the assembled crowd that will be there. So, Lorenzo, if you can shoot over there, we'd very much appreciate that. Meanwhile, Matteo, I'm very intrigued by the, um, the title of your presentation because it has the word remote service as a service contained yeah. in it. So would you like to, kind of, before we put your slides up, would you like to briefly introduce your talk to us? Yes, my talk is a bit of a, a new product, or not new product, but new project that we made in Atlas that for uh, support a new mechanism for provisioning a phone. And one of the new mechanisms we want to implement is the remote provisioning service that uh, many vendors uh, offer as a service. But as we can see in the presentation, uh, it's not so easy because uh, every vendors want to do the things in its own way there are no clear documentation the protocols is not so modern difficult uh, to use uh, maybe also to scale uh, so we choose to build a new component only for the scope for the scope of support this type of mechanism for it for great the, well, for thank the you for Thank you for introducing it like that. And I know you'll be striking a chord with many of the Klucon deconstructed audience that have probably spent hours around phone provisioning. It's one of those kind of edge jobs that always takes up more time than you'd really like. So let's get your slides up on the screen or your presentation okay. up on the screen and you can go ahead and fire away. Thank you. No, actually, uh, Matteo, I'm not seeing your... Oh, there, there they are. They yeah, are there wait now. a moment. Okay, ah. we'll put those up for okay. you. Okay, wait. I know it's a little bit messy right now. Okay. Brilliant. Okay, thank you. Okay, hi, everyone. In this talk, I'm going to show you a new remote provisioning service gateway. Before continuing, let me introduce to you a little of the theory behind a remote provisioning service. The scope of a remote provisioning service is to solve the problem of the first time phone configuration. Because without uh, the first time that the phone boot up is uh, don't know where is the public server or uh, what is their intern or where is the, the phone book. So we have to set up some mechanism for deliver this information to a phone. Without an uh, RPS, we, the, the phone must relay on some local mechanism for discovering their configuration, for example, the DHCP option 66 and UPnP. But sometimes you don't have access to the DHCP server for the configuration of the option 66 and uh, can be tricky to configure all the routing of the multicast traffic for the UPnP protocol. So what is the phases of uh, the provisioning of a phone with an RPS? The first time that the phone uh, boot up will uh, contact the vendor remote provisioning service with their MAC address. Then the vendor's uh, service will look up in the database of the configured MAC address and if uh, he will find one, will return the configuration to the phone. In the configuration will be the, the URL of the actual configuration for the phone. Then the phone will contact a local or remote PBX server for retry the actual configuration. And in this way, end the, the phases of the first time configuration. And uh, what we can do with a remote provisioning service, or uh, the, as we can call RPS, we can assign a configuration to a, to a phone even before it's a take out of the box. And we can massively configure a large group of phone because we can automate the procedure via API calls. And uh, why building an RPS gateway? 
One of the reasons is the vendor implementation, because uh, every vendor implement some set of uh, feature that is similar, but not so similar. Different uh, is, uh, and obviously, every vendor implement its own API interfaces. So we have an API interfaces for every vendor that we want to use. And uh, every vendor uh, use, uh, as for the communication, the XML RPC protocol. That uh, is not so, so common to use, so easy. Maybe we want to use something more modern, like, for example, in HTTPS, uh, HTTP or S interfaces. Another, uh, another, uh, uh, another motivation for us for uh, build uh, an RPS gateway is the Leopard project. The Leopard project is uh, the refactoring of uh, the provisioning component of NetVoice, that is the PBX solution of NetList, the company where I, I work. And the naming is uh, taken from an uh, Italian novel, Il Gatto Pardo. And one of the key phrases of the novel is uh, if you want things to stay as they are, things have, will have to change. What does it mean for us? For us, we mean that if you want to maintain our customer base, we want to maintain uh, our clients happy, we have to modernize our solution. So we choose uh, this, uh, to, we choose to use the naming based on this novel also for uh, this key phrases. And uh, what is the goal of the Leopard project? For us, it was to use most modern technology, introduction of new provisioning mechanism like the RPS, support only a well-defined set of phone and vendors. In, this, in our case, we choose to support Snow, Gigaset, Yelling, and Fanville. And at the end, release most of the component of the project like open source, for, as open source project. I told you before, the name was taken from, uh, a, a, the, the, a, from the Leopard novel, and the Tanker di Falconieri is one of the main characters of the novel. And we choose to naming uh, one, uh, two of uh, the key components of the project by the name of the main character. That, and Tancredi is the first name, is uh, the phone uh, provision engine, and Falconieri is the remote provision gateway. What is the role of Falconieri? Falconieri will provide a unified HTTP OS interface to the vendor's RPS service and will store the credential for access to the vendor RPS server. So in this way, we don't have to, we don't have to tell the credential for access to the service to our customer, our user. Now, let's see what is the API that we are going to use for implementing our gateway, our semantic. First of all, the semantic that we are going to implement. We want uh, to implement a simple semantic. So for every MAC address, if a configuration don't exist, simply create a new one. If for a given MAC address, the configuration already exists, Overwrite the previous configuration with the new one. This is an ideal endpoint that we are going to build for our gateway. So ideally, we want to a simple endpoint, maybe only one, detail of the type put, composed with the provider that we want to use and the MAC address we want to configure. And uh, as body of the request, maybe a JSON object with the URL of the configuration. Every vendor, even if implemented different interfaces, every vendor have in common some object. Every vendor implements an object of a MAC address, that is the MAC address of the phone that we want to configure. Every vendor has a redirect tool. That is the URL where uh, to find the actual phone configuration. And uh, every vendor have the concept of a group. 
that is uh, in some vendor is called uh, server, some vendor call it the provider, but at the end uh, is uh, a list of devices configured with the same redirect tool. We have choose to classify the vendor's API in three categories, the good, the bad, and the ugly. And we are going to, I'm going to show you why every vendor end up in every category. For the good category, we have uh, SNOM. SNOM uh, have uh, a good documentation, good public documentation. Simple API, only seven API, and uh, HTTPS endpoint. This is the API call that we are going to use for implementing the Falcon UI semantic. We are going to call the register phone providing the MAC address of the phone and the provision URL. And if the configuration don't exist, ZOM will, will be simply creating a new one. But if already exists, ZOM will override the, the previous one. In the bad category, we find Gigaset. Gigaset have a public documentation. Even if uh, you can find a better documentation once you have obtained the username and password from Gigaset for access to the portal, Symbol API, only seven API, and HTTPS endpoint. Why we put in the bed? We put Gigaset in the bed because uh, Gigaset require a, C a CRC code for a, a configure a MAC address. And this code is uh, printed only in the label of the phone. And there is no public documentation for the calculation of, this, of uh, that uh, CRC. This uh, CRC make uh, almost impossible or very difficult any type of automatic discover and configuration of the phone. But maybe you can have the CRC code disabled for your account if you ask to Gigaset. This is the API call that we are going to use for implementing the Falcon UI semantic. We are going to first call the deregistered device passing the MAC ID, and the MAC ID is uh, obtained by concatenate the MAC address of the phone with the CRC code. Then register the device with the MAC ID, the provision URL, and provider. Provider is the group of uh, Gigaset that we are going not to use because we are going to provide a provision URL instead. As, we, as you can see here, we, we have to, before uh, register a new device, they register the older device because of uh, Gigaset don't let, uh, don't let you to override the configuration. In the Agri category, we find uh, two vendors, Yearlink and Fanville. Yearlink have uh, a public documentation, but uh, in my opinion, too many API, 16 and HTTPS endpoint. Why we put Yearlink in the, in the ugly category? Because uh, the API are very overloaded and redundant. For example, uh, we have many, many API that uh, do almost the same thing, it's like different, uh, with the same name, but uh, with different number of parameter. But then the, it's very bad the API design. Let's see what is the API that we have to use for implementing the Falcon UI semantic for Yearlink. We are going to call the register device with unique URL API, providing the MAC address of the phone, server name, that is a group for Yearlink, provision URL is our provision URL, and is overfly is the flag for tell Yearlink to uh, permit the overriding of the previous configuration. But as I told you before, the design is not very clear because we can find the documentation and other API call that is named register device without the unique URL, so register device, where we are going to, where we have to provide the MAC address server name. And uh, in this case, we can see that uh, in the API call where we have to use the, where we can provide directly the provision URL, we can also specify a server name. 
and we will find two functions identically of this uh, one with or without its override flag. So at the end, uh, the, the documentation and the API interface uh, can be very confusing. You, uh, you don't, uh, you, you can't be sure, sure what uh, API call you have to use. Another uh, vendor in the Agile category is Fanville. Fanville uh, don't have any public documentation, too many API, 19, and they use uh, a HTTP endpoint. Why we put Fanville in the Agile? Because uh, no HTTPS, but require a double hash of the password for the authentication. So you have to do a hash of MD5 hash of your password, then the MD5 hash of the hash of your password and use that hash as password. And uh, we have to do too many steps for implement, uh, implementing a simple Falconier semantic. Let's see what is uh, this uh, step. First of all, we have to add the server, so it's uh, the group for Fanville, where uh, we are going to set the server name and provision URL. In this way, we are going to create uh, a group of device with the, uh, and the name of the group will be the provision URL. So we have a new group for a unique provision URL. Then we have to deregister the device because Fanville don't let you to override the previous configuration. And then add the MAC address to the just created group of uh, MAC address. Or at least is what we think at the beginning of uh, the project. But after some test, we, uh, we, we, we have realized that uh, the server name have uh, a limit in the length of the server name. So we can use the provision URL. And we choose to use uh, as the name of the group of the server, the MAC address of the phone. And we will have a group for every phone configured. Not so bad, but okay, it's not clean. After another test, we find out that uh, we can't simply uh, call the group as the MAC address, but we have also to delete the previous group or server created because Fanville don't let you to override the configuration of just created server. So we have to delete it. After some other test, we find out that we can't use at all our server. The our server API calls because the our server don't let you to configure some aspect of the phone, of the group of the phone because uh, some older uh, model will be stuck uh, trying uh, to retry the configuration via, via DHCP protocol. And uh, you can tell uh, to the phone using this API call uh, to apply the configuration just after they have retried it. So just after the reboot. At the end, uh, we find out that we have to use the add material server API calls. But the add material server API calls uh, have uh, almost no documentation. This is the screenshot, uh, a screenshot of the documentation. As you can see, we have to provide to the add material server an array of key value where every key, every meaning semantic of the key and the value is uh, not documented anywhere. And uh, we have to find out uh, the meaning of every value by reverse engineering the web interface of the Fanville portal. This is the final steps for uh, implementing the Falconieri semantic uh, for Fanville. First of all, we're going to delete the previous uh, group of device, then create a new group with the add material server, where we can see that uh, key value, the list of key value were in uh, CF, uh, the name equal to Mac is the name of the server. CFGPF mode equal one tell uh, to Fanville to tell to the phone to apply the configuration just after the reboot of the phone with uh, the CFGDHCP opt equal to false. We are going to disable the DHCP provisioning with uh, PMP enable equal to false. We are going to 
disable the PMP provisioning, and then we can simply pass the redirect URL uh, by a simple string, but we have to, valor, we have to set this uh, value, for example, with the CFG prot equal to one, two, four, or five. We are going to tell to Fumble that uh, our URL is uh, of uh, the type, uh, the, the protocol uh, of the type HTTP, HTTPS, FTP, TFTP. But the meaning of this number and the value of the number, we have to find out by, but by reverse engineering the web interface. There is no documentation. Then we have to provide the domain of uh, our URL and the path of the URL. After we have created the, the server, we are going to delete the configuration of previous MAC address and then register and then add the MAC address to the just create server. So let's talk a little about the, the Falconieri, is the gateway that we are build. One of the characteristics is the open source AGPL version 3. It's a single, single Golang binary. Uh, you can easily deploy with the provided Ansible role. It was created uh, with the two factor app methodology in mind. It's stateless, and because it's stateless, you can easily scale vertically and horizontally. This is the API interfaces of Falconieri. As you can see, it's very similar to the ideal API interface that we want to build. We have only one endpoint of the type with the verb put. So if you call put slash provider slash the provider that you want to use slash the MAC address, and as body you use the a JSON object with the field URL, and you have to set the field with the, the actual uh, URL where uh, the phone can find the configuration. And uh, there is uh, one query parameter that is optional, that is a C uh, CRC code that we have to use in case of uh, Gigaset. This is uh, the usage of Falconieri. The usage is very simple because uh, Falconieri has, a, has a only one option only one command line option that uh, tells Falconieri where to find the configuration. You can configure Falconieri in uh, two ways. One via JSON file, and the other one via environment variables. If you choose to set some value via environment variables, the value in the environment variable takes the presence over the value in the JSON file. This is an example of configuration of Falconieri. We have uh, the providers block where we are, we are going to define the configuration for every provider that we want to use. In this example, we can see the configuration for the zone provider where we set the username for access to the port, so access to the API of the provider, the password, the RPC URL, that is uh, the URL where we are going to make the API calls, and the option disable for enable and disable the provider. What is missing from Falconieri? We don't, uh, we choose to not implement any type of client authentication, but uh, we, but you can do by putting a reverse proxy in front of Falconieri. In our uh, deployment, we choose, uh, for example, to use traffic with uh, an external authentication. Then we don't have uh, any API for configure a list of uh, device, but uh, you have to do an API call for every device that you want to configure. Maybe in the future, we are going to make more deployment strategy, for example, via RPM packages, DEB packages, Docker or Elm, maybe. And a uh, uh, thing that we don't have implemented is uh, the deletion API. So there is uh, any way uh, passing through Falconieri to delete the configuration of an API, of a configuration of a phone. But at the end, uh, every pull request, announcement, critic are very, very welcome. And uh, this is the URL of the project. 
before uh, end, let me remind you of uh, Tank Ready because uh, if uh, Falconieri help uh, the phone to find the configuration, Tank Ready build the actual phone configuration. And uh, here we have the, the URL for of the project. Before end, let me show you some uh, statistics of the usage of uh, the Leopard project in Netlist. First of all, as I told you before, one of the key component is the RPS. So we, we want to, we want to uh, measurement, we want to, uh, to check the availability of uh, every provider. And uh, we have uh, checked the availability by configure MAC address every two minutes and check the result. At the end, in the last 90 days, we have that uh, Yelling, Snow, and Fanville have uh, around 99% of availability and Gigaset 95 is um, not so good, but uh, you can, if uh, you fail the first time, you can always try a second time. So you can go, you can uh, make the things work. And this is the usage of uh, Falconieri, of uh, Falconieri installation of Netlist. The Leopard project was released as a private beta in uh, 26th of March and released as general availability of, uh, in the 6th of July. In the private beta period, we have registered uh, uh, five, around 500 of unique phones and around uh, and in the availability uh, period, we have registered uh, uh, around uh, 9,000, 9, 9, well, sorry, nine, uh, around uh, almost 1,000 of uh, device. So, thank you for listening. I'm Matteo Valentini, a software developer for an Italian open source company called Netedis. This is my contact in case uh, do you want to uh, reach me later. Thank you again. That's great, Matteo. Thank you very much. That's uh, an extremely useful looking project. And uh, we're very grateful for you sharing that information. I hope you'll be able to nip over into the broadcast cafe uh, for people to ask you some questions after this, because I'm, I'm sure there will be some questions. That's a, a subject that, that's not ne necessarily dear to everybody's hearts, but it's a very necessary subject to be talking about. So thanks for taking the time and coming and joining us from Thank all the way in Italy. It's a pleasure to have you in ClueCon Deconstructed. We're going to say bye-bye to you for now. See you in the broadcast cafe. Okay. And we'll say hello to Abby. How's it going, Abby? Hi, everyone. I'm so excited because I have another raffle prize to be giving out. And uh, today, right now, we're going to be giving out a free switch hoodie, which is very exciting. Is this so, the first time ever for a free switch hoodie? Yes, we've had lots of free switch t-shirts. Ooh, ah. Uh, but we've never had a free switch hoodie. So this is a very coveted prize. And if you're listening in and you don't win, that is okay. We have a ClueCon swag store where you can uh, get a free switch hoodie. We've got uh, this t-shirt. We've got ClueCon t-shirts, a sticker, a hat, uh, uh, some games, and, and uh, a lot of cool stuff. So... Without any further ado, everybody who's joined us at ClueCon Deconstructed has been added to a data database, and we've been selecting names at random. So it's time to select our winner for the free party. Let's see. Let's see. <laughs> Yay! And the winner is Fred Posner. Fred Posner. Give a talk, I believe. <laughs> yeah, he's an upcoming speaker in the Kama Ilio Hour that's happening next. Isn't that so exciting? Well, congratulations, Fred. Um, I'm sure he's listening. You just won a free switch hoodie. Wow, very nice. And all you had to do was uh, come to ClueCon Deconstructed. <laughs> Woohoo! Woohoo! Also, a quick reminder that tonight is the Gigabit Reception. It's going to be so much fun. 
4.30 Central to 6.30 Central. We're going to have karaoke, games, movies, chit-chat, good company, uh, bring your own drinks, <laughs> of course, and it's going to be so much fun. And a quick reminder to follow us on all of our channels, our Slack channel at signalwire.community, our uh, social media, uh, our uh, Twitter and Facebook, and uh, that's going to help keep you updated with everything that's happening for the rest of the day today. And you'll get some information about what ClueCon is going to look like next year. So you'll get the information as we have it. And that's all I have to announce for now. I'll be back a little bit later for some more prizes. There's just so much to look forward to today, isn't there? So much oh, yeah. to look forward to. And in just less than half an hour, we're going to be back at 1.30 Central. And as I said, it's a Kama Ilio dominated hour. We've got uh, Daniel Constantin Miela, looking forward to that, and Fred Posner. Uh, just announced the winner so be sure to come back and join us but for now abby and i are going to say bye-bye reminding you as we go that you must go to the broadcast cafe if you want to ask our previous speakers any questions they'll be hanging out there bye for now <laughs>